Okay, this is a room where we celebrate, you know, many of the abolitionists that helped us get from slavery in the South to supposedly more freedom in the North. And I think one of the most important is who we call the father of the Underground Railroad, William Still. It's a picture of him there, good looking guy from uh, near Medford. He is the one that um, helped us quite a bit. He's named the father of the Underground Railroad. When he was about 24 years old, he goes to Philadelphia and he gets a job with the second abolitionist society. The second one is composed of um, mostly Quakers, Lucretia Mott, the Bernies, and mostly Quakers, right? The first one was um, uh, developed in, in, in Boston, but this is the second one, and they're in Philadelphia, and he gets a job with them. His first job is um, uh, like cleaning, and I guess he does, does his job so well that they promote him to um, mail clerk. Now, all of a sudden they decide they need someone to interview the runaways who reach Philadelphia. So they form a committee, and he is voted to be a member of that committee, in fact, the secretary. Now his job is to interview the runaways that reach Philadelphia, either settle them in Philadelphia or get them further north. This is the time during that law where the government says, I'm going to help you, uh, you, the people who are enslaving our people. I'm going to help you get your slaves back. And this is the time when the Underground Railroad is very useful, very important. Now he is the one that is supposed to help these runaways either settle in Philadelphia or get north without being caught, right? William Still. And he does a wonderful job. He uh, came from a very historical family. His mother was enslaved and, and father enslaved in Maryland. They escaped. Mother escaped by way of uh, Underground Railroad. The father escaped before her and came to New Jersey and developed a home for her. She had 18 children. Um, William was the 18th child. The 17th child was James Still. And he's known in New Jersey as the Black Doctor of the Pines. He's celebrated here, his office, because he is the one who cured people with, um, who had cancer with roots and herbs. He wrote a book about it. Very famous doctor. He was also an abolitionist. He became kind of wealthy, he had houses in uh, Medford and houses in uh, Mount Holly. The state of New Jersey is celebrating him by helping to build a museum in Medford for him. The building was his office when he was alive. That's his brother, that's his oldest brother, this one. But Willing, um, he was the youngest, the 18th child. This is another one, um, Thomas Garrett from Delaware. Amazing man, Quaker. If you were a runaway and you got to Delaware, you could go to his house and he would take you in his carriage with the secret compartment, Kennett Square, and you would arrive in Philadelphia to William Still's office. And then William Still would send you further north. It was wonderful, right? This man was great. He assisted at least 2,700 slaves to freedom in his lifetime. He was an active abolitionist for over 40 years. His family hid slaves in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, in a farmhouse. He was fined $5,400 for knowingly harboring fugitives in his trial in 1848. But he continued to help slaves escape. This man, Thomas Garrett, amazing. He was like Harriet Tubman. Her friends would say, you're putting yourself in danger by doing what you're doing. And he and, he and she would say, but God wants me to do it. And when God wants me to stop, you know, God will let me know. Amazing man, Thomas Garrett. 
and he and Harriet did a lot of work together in uh, Kennett Square in that area too. Harriet Tubman was some, she was all over the place. She worked in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, and near that place we have all that beautiful flowers. She was working in that, in that place, in that area, and he, with her, you know, two of the, the biggest abolitionists. New Jersey was an amazing state, believe me. One part in the history, New Jersey, parts of New Jersey was sold to the Quakers, right? And at that time, the, the Quakers divided the state into two parts, east and west. They, occupied, they the Quakers, occupied the west. We're in the west part now. Um, the other part was occupied by um, people who had plantations. And they were the ones that treated us like we were treated down in, in South. That's what books say. We were treated brutally in New Jersey. Can you imagine it? New Jersey was one of the states that voted against Lincoln. And it um, invited um, plantation owners' children up here to school. In Burlington City, they went to school. And uh, it was more like a Southern state than, you know, a Northern state. And here it talks about a large and vibrant African-American community lived in New Jersey before the Civil War. On the eve of the conflict, the black population was 25,336 out of a total of 646,699. Years after the abolition of slavery, African Americans still lacked legal and political rights. The new state constitution of 1844 restricted voting to white male citizens. The Fugitive Slave Bill subjected escapees from the South to deportation. During this tense period, leading up to the conflict, that's the Civil War, African-American community leaders emerged to play important roles in the abolition movement and the Underground Railroad. Enslaved African-Americans were first brought to colonial New Jersey by the Dutch in the 16th century. Slaves, work in, slaves worked in agriculture, in trades, and as domestics. By the late 18th century, slavery was in decline. The Gradual Abolition Act of 804 gave owners the rights to the labors of slaves born after July 4th, 1804, until the age of 25 for males and 21 for females, at which time they were free. There were still many slaves in New Jersey after the passage of the law. According to the 1810 census, there were 10,851 enslaved African Americans in New Jersey out of a population of 245, 562 people. The New Jersey law of 1846 abolished slavery changing the status of remaining slaves to permanent apprentices. So, you know, people say, oh, that slavery in New Jersey was abolished in, in this year, um, uh, 1846. It wasn't. They just changed the names of, um, the names of slaves to apprentice. The same thing, right? The colonization movement. In the early 19th century, New Jerseyans advocated the removal of black residents to Africa. Reverend Robert Finley of Basking Ridge played an important role in this endeavor, the founding of the American Colonization Society in 1816. A New Jersey chapter of the society was formed in 1824 and revived in 1838. In 1853, the society purchased a ship, the Saluda, and 160,000 acres of land to be added to the Liberian colony. 
Ultimately, few African Americans moved to Liberia from New Jersey, where most black residents opposed the movement. New Jersey was an important, well, we, we, we talked about this, but the fact that there was this movement in New Jersey to send us back, and that these people in authority bought, purchased a boat and purchased all this land in Liberia. I wonder what happened to that. This one, not many people, I think, know about him. This is a pencil drawing, and his name is Martin Delaney. He is called the father of black nationalism. Before, you have Marcus Garvey, right? Before Marcus Garvey and the Nation of Islam, who talk about going back to Africa, maintaining or accepting some African values in, in our lives. He was, um, he was the father of black nationalism. When Lincoln, if you read that, it talks about how Lincoln was always wanting us out of the United States. Go to South America, you know, go any place, but just get out. Europeans coming in all the time, but wanting us out. Colonization society, like we talked about. He was for us getting out. And so our people um, were not for it. And uh, this one decided, well, maybe we should go back to Africa. You know, that's where we're from. So he uh, goes to Africa, the authorities there say, yeah, we want African Americans to come back to be with us. But before he could get us organized, the Civil War breaks out. And um, Frederick Douglass, who's interested in having our people volunteer for the Civil War, ask him to help to get our people, you know, signed up for the Civil War. And so he helps Frederick Douglass. He's decorated, I don't know what, you know, what, but he's decorated. He's an amazing man. He goes to um, college in the 1800s. He goes to Harvard. How do you get to Harvard in the 1800s, right? But he gets there. But he doesn't stay long because the students write the dean of admissions. We don't want this black guy here because he would demean, he would degrade the college, right? Harvard. And before he could do anything, you know, he's dismissed. But this guy's amazing, right? So he's in the Civil War, he's decorated. He's one of the first persons that, that's given a commission. And uh, so we honor, we, we celebrate him for having that idea of going back to Africa, Martin Delaney. He writes a few books about our status in the 1800s. You know, he's really a really bright guy. Over here we have John Woolman, a Quaker, born in New Jersey. And his house that he left after going to Europe is about 10 minutes from here. And it's now a historical spot. You can go there and, and uh, look at the furniture and stuff in the house. You have to call first. But John, um, uh, John Woolman, was a Quaker, and he um, was against slavery, and he was against using, wearing anything that were made by the hands of slaves. People didn't care, you know, and, but he tried very hard. He, some uh, time there were instances in the Quaker uh, church or where they were segregating uh, black people. You couldn't reach a certain status in the Quaker State Church. And so he was the man that he recommended to uh, be considered for uh, uh, something like a minister. But you know, they, the Quakers didn't accept him, but he at least advocated for the man. And uh, <clears throat> a man was not even able to have um, his, his marriage in the Quaker um, church. Uh, but he advocated for the man, even though that did, did not come about. And these are some of his books, his own books. And some of those books, it talks about Perth Amboy and what was happening out there. And this is a picture of the house about 20 minutes from here. That is a historical site. And these are some of the things he would not use, like molasses, sugar, dye. The man went to uh, Europe 
You know, he traveled to Europe uh, a lot, and uh, while he was there, he became ill, and he died in Europe, and he's buried in Europe. But the man is amazing. He's not celebrated enough for, you know, what he um, felt was right. His name, John Woolman, born in New Jersey. Over here is um, Lincoln on slavery. Sometimes when people come here, they read that, they don't like it. <laughs> but it, it's the truth. Um, it says that Lincoln was not a friend of ours. And it's true, Lincoln was not a friend of black people, right? And he did want us out. He was not an admirer of the black man and did not believe blacks should be granted the rights of American citizens and did not wish that they be a part of American society. He believed that all blacks should be removed from the United States and resettled in some other country, like Liberia. That was Lincoln, right? He's not presented that way, is he? No. I remember reading a book where it talks about how Lincoln, as, uh, when he was in the presidency, invited um, like six very um, elite uh, black people to the White House. And the report from the people say that he, you know, he was um, always talking about race, and uh, sometimes he was very kind, but always talking about race. And most of what he said to them was, um, I know that uh, you're not happy being here in the United States, you know, because of your race. And the white people are not happy having you here in the United States, and they want you out. And he said to them, uh, you know, I want you out. You could go to South America, where they're building uh, salt mines, or you could go some other place. But in South America, you know, you could make a lot of money, and you could take your people with you. And, you know, they could make money, but make sure that the people you take have minds like white people. <laughs> That's in some books that I, wrote. I got the time and everything. And the black people who were uh, invited by him quoted that. Lincoln really wanted us out you know, get out. He said if slavery did not exist among them, they would not introduce it. He's talking about the uh, slave owners. If it did now exist among us, we should not instantly give it up. That was his attitude, right? So that's Lincoln. These are some abolitionists, some wonderful people who put their lives on the line to help us gain some measure of freedom. We were running from slavery in the South to the North, thinking that, you know, in the North everything is going to be rosier. And in some instances it was better, but it was a, a different form of slavery in the North. Some of these you probably know. William Allison has a, he had a, built a drugstore in 1731 in Burlington City. That was an underground railroad site. He is, you know, the builder of that site. And that's where we, we had our first underground railroad um, educational center. But he built it in, in 1731. Quaker, William Allison. This man, William Lambert from Trenton. People don't seem to know him, but this man was amazing. He, he started off as a young man, you know, on ships sailing. And the per place that he liked best was a Detroit area. People were really making, blacks making progress in Detroit. So he goes there, uh, he wants to settle there when he was about 23, 24. And he goes there and he gets married there and he becomes a member of the community. He develops the, the first abolitionist um, group in Detroit. And he also has this group of men, they call the African American men or men of order of mysteries or something like that. And these men, it was like they had um, different handshakes, different codes in the way they spoke. Um, it was like a, 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 I th it was like a, a cult or something. They were on the streets in uh, Detroit. Because you know, if you, our people were wanting to go to Canada now, you know, 
because of the um, that law that says the state's gonna, uh, the United States government's gonna help, you know, get you back to the um, to the plantation. That's what our government said. So most of our, a lot of our people are afraid. They want to go to Canada. They don't want to go back into slavery. So, uh, so they get to Canada through the Underground Railroad, or, or because of their own, their own devices, right? And they're stuck in Detroit because in Detroit there's that uh, river that goes from uh, Detroit to on, into Ontario, and they're in this place, not knowing exactly what to do. And this man has men on the streets, and they know that you're a runaway by the way you look and your, you know, the way you're dressed. And they will go up to you, these men on the streets, these black men, and they will ask you certain code questions and do certain code handshakes. And if you can do them, then they'll take you to him and he will meet your medical needs and then get you into Canada. But if you can't, they have nothing to do with you because even though they're black, some of those men were, would take you back into slavery, right? But isn't that something that they had their own codes, their own speech, handshakes, um, amazing. Under his, this man from uh, uh, New Jersey, Trent, and a lot of uh, many of these, like Frederick Douglass, and some of these who were traveling to Canada often would stop at his house in, in Detroit. And um, they say that he hung himself, you know, that he was very um, distressed and um, distraught. He wanted um, education for African Americans. That was another thing that he does desired. But he's an enemy of the United States government because he's helping people escape helping people get into Canada, escape slavery, right? He's um, hung, he hangs himself, so the story goes. But many people don't believe that he hung himself, that he was, you know, he was murdered. William Lambert from Trenton, New Jersey, amazing person. Uh, then here is um, Abigail Goodwin from Salem, New Jersey. About two years ago, some people from Salem came in here, you know, to see the museum. And we have her house up there on the board. And they said, oh, Abigail Goodman's house, it's going up for sale. <laughs> you kidding? Oh, it's going up for sale. So um, a friend of mine and I went down there in Salem, New Jersey. Because, you know, Salem was part of a big route to come into New Jersey, Salem and they would go to different uh, routes into New Jersey and then into New York. So we went there and we saw her house, beautiful, $150,000, beautiful land. And the person who was selling the house took us up on the third floor where they told us that uh, Abigail Goodman hid runaway slaves on the third floor in this particular closet. It was really amazing. I wish I had had the money to buy it. Beautiful piece of real estate in state, uh, but the next time we went down there, someone had, um, you know, so it was sold. But that's right on the main street in Salem, and that um, was known for being um, underground railroad site. That's Abigail, Abigail Goodman right here, and this man, James Fortin, he was um, like a millionaire in the 1800s in Philadelphia. He had a factory uh, where he made, made sales for ships and everything. And he had um, 40 or 50 workers, you know, mixed group workers. And he was, he was a rich and a wonderful speaker. And he was known for his um, speaking about the uh, evils of slavery, right? but he was really wealthy. Now, this is the um, second abolition, abolitionist um, committee. The first one was developed in Boston by William Lloyd Garrison. The second one uh, uh, developed by all of these Quakers, Barneys, and you know, um, 
This woman, Lucretia Mott, you've heard of her? Lucretia Mott? Yeah, well, she's in the Anti-Slavery and the Women's Suffrage Act, uh, Act yes. Um, she um, advocated for women's suffrage. This man in the middle, his name is Robert Purvis. He's not a Quaker. He's biracial, black, white. His father, really a really rich white man, right? He goes to one of the biggest schools, uh, elite schools, and he's ahead of this uh, second abolitionist um, committee. He's ahead of this. And he is the one that always uh, confronts Lincoln. When Lincoln is telling us to get out, he is saying, you know, we're not going anyplace. We have a vested interest in this country, right? And um, he's always confronting Lincoln. Now, back to this one, who we say is the father of the Underground Railroad, still. When he's about 24, he goes to Philadelphia. I guess where he lives is too tame for him. Look at him, good looking guy, right? And you know, it's too slow. He goes to Philadelphia and he become, uh, he works for these people, second abolitionist community. His first job is cleaning. The second job, he's promoted to mail clerk. And when they want to um, have someone who uh, has the ability to, to interview runaways when they reach Philadelphia, they uh, hire him. And he does a really nice job uh, helping these people, runaways who reach Philadelphia and sending them further north. His, uh, this is Levi Coffin, uh, Cincinnati, Ohio. He's Quaker, right? And often, Stills would send people as far as Cincinnati, you know, and then they'd probably go on to Canada. He would call Levi and say, Levi, I'm sending some packages to you. They would be people, be at the station to meet, to get these packages, and Levi would be there. And then he would send them further north. Isn't that something? This man, O Alada Ekiano, he is African. He is in English history. He was enslaved in, Af in um, Africa. He was like a son of a king, he was a, like a prince. Enslaved in Africa, in the Caribbean, and in America. And he said the, the slavery that was the baddest was in America. It was like taking your complete humanity away. Eventually he is freed, right? And he writes a book about the Middle Passage. He goes back to Britain and he talks about slavery. He's like Frederick Douglass in the United States. The British celebrate him for his role in um, you know, what happens. He's an abolitionist in Britain, and he's classed with the, the biggest, the, the most celebrated white abolitionist in Britain. This man here, Aluda. Iki, Iki Anna, this man from Africa. And then, uh, let's see who else is from New Jersey. Uh, this man, Reverend Thomas Oliver, born in Salem, New Jersey. He goes to Princeton University's a School of Theology. After he gets his education, he goes to one of the um, places in Canada. Well, they had settlements in Canada, right? And he goes up there and he works with the people who have developed the settlements. He's from Salem, New Jersey, Reverend Thomas Oliver. I don't know anybody else from New Jersey up here, but all of these people have their own stories to tell and their wonderful stories um, about, you know, how they helped um, people get on their feet and uh, how they helped people get out of the South. Frederick Douglass, uh, the wonderf wonderful stories. We said that book over there on the second shelf is the first edition of the book by William Still. And in that book, he uh, reveals some of the work he's done with people that he's helped get out of uh, uh, slavery, taken from uh, the South to the North. And it's an um, interesting book. 
One of the stories is about a man from Virginia, how um, when he came from working in the fields to his shack, he found that his wife and his children were sold without him. And he is so crushed, you know, he, wanted, he wants to kill himself. So he has some friends though, both of their names are Smith. One's a black guy who does shoe repairing on horses or something. And the other guy, Smith, is a, a, a doctor. So they try to console him, right? You know, you have your life to live and we're gonna help you. So they decided on a, um, what they were gonna do. They were gonna put him in a box and they were gonna send him to these people in Philadelphia in a box. And so the, um, the white man, you know, the doctor says, well, I'm gonna go to Philadelphia and make certain that these people will accept you. So he goes to Philadelphia and talks to somebody in this committee. And they say, uh-uh, we're not, we can't do that. We're not gonna get ourselves in trouble. But they do it anyway. They put him in a box with some food, water, and they put him on a freight. And I, mean, I don't remember how many days it takes him, but he arrives in Philadelphia and William Still and his committee meet him, right? And he's free. And um, uh, they open the box he's still, and he, he uh, steps out of the box and he starts singing a, a Christian song about you know, how God has helped him. That's one of the stories that he writes about. And um, then he goes all over speaking, you know, up to Boston, speaking about his freedom. And then the slave owners, you know, know where he is and they're after him. But that's one of the stories. And there's a, one more story I'll tell you about. There's a story in there about a couple. The woman is um, interracial and she's so light, she can pass for white, right? She's so white. And uh, the man is very dark but they're in love, so they get married, and whatever marriage they could do it during that time. So they decide to run away. And um, uh, evidently he's working, I think, I guess he's making some money, he gets some money somehow. They run away. She um, gets her hair cut, and she um, gets clothes, borrows clothes, a man, men's clothes. And she cuts her hair and everything, so, and she has bandages all on her arm and, and around her throat, scarves, so that she looks just like a boy or a man, right? And that's how they escape. She's a, bo a man, and her husband is her handyman, you know, black guy, right? And they escape uh, slavery in, in, in the Deep South. And... Um, they, um, see what happened, I remember, but they um, are helped by the committee, you know? And when they get here and um, they're celebrating, they're sent up to Boston, everybody's so happy. They've uh, um, outwitted the slave owners. I don't remember exactly what happened. Oh, they go to England because um, the government is cracking down now on runaway slaves and they don't have anything to prove that they're not, a run, they're not runaways. So they're invited to England and they go to England and they stay until after 1865 when we're free and then they come back and I think they settle in Savannah, Georgia or something. Isn't that amazing? That's in that book. So that's what William still wrote about all the th people that he helped. The, the book is probably on the first edition it's probably on sale for about $40, you know, but it's amazing. These are pictures of Underground Railroad places that have been confirmed or approved by the National Park System. It's a long time ago, so there are probably a lot more. But these, every state, at the time that we cut these out, were like Maryland, Michigan, New Jersey, all of these were approved Underground Railroad places. And these were New Jersey Underground Railroad communities uh, and where there were communities in New Jersey, right? It's interesting, there's community in Moorestown, Moore, Moore, Black, Moorestown, Cherry Hill. All of those places had 
communities of, of uh, blacks, you know. And in those places like Haddonfield, Quakers helped us to um, gain some of that, you know, buy some of the property there. But, you know, we don't know it now, right? Morristown, more black, big community of, uh, of uh, blacks. Lawnside, you heard of Lawnside? Peter Mott House, that was um, um, uh, a person who lived during that slavery time, who his house is um, an underground railroad site, you know? And it, uh, it, it's really, really a nice, a good place to see, interesting place. Salem, Greenwich, all of these places listed here were underground railroad uh, places. And then in here, uh, about five years ago, we visited Harriet Tubman's house, and it was really, really nice, you know. Her place she purchased is now in the middle of a, a middle-class uh, community. And those houses are really, really cute, really unique houses, you know. And uh, we, we, that's a picture of her house there. In front of the house, you'll see a brick pathway to the house. And when we were there, I talked to the person who was assisting the curator, right? And I was telling her about what we had here. So the assistant, without permission, goes out, take a brick from that pathway, and gave it to us. That's the brick. She wasn't supposed to do it, right? But we were really happy. This brick's built in the 1800s in front of Harriet Tubman's house. And then this is, I said, we said that the national park system is taking over. This is some of the stuff that was taken over, off one of the houses and they're repairing. You've heard of Timbuktu. Timbuktu is one of the first settlements in um, this area, black settlement. You know, Rancocas Creek, right? It's on Rancocas Creek. And Rancocas Creek is known for uh, the, the pathway that we use to go north. And so um, Timbuktu, people stopped and settled there. People running away, going north, would pass through there. So the university, what is the, um, Pennsylvania, um, did a, um, a dig, archaeological dig, and that's, um, Temple did it. And those are some of the artifacts. And I don't know, I didn't read the conclusion or what but those are some of the artifacts that was um, found on that dig. And this, the last picture here, shows the um, Quaker Meeting House, where in 1668, I think, the Quakers decided they would have nothing to do with slavery, but they did. In fact, some of the Quakers became very wealthy from slavery. Rhode Island was the state that made the most money off of slavery. Rhode Island was the place where they made the rum that they took to Africa to trade for people. Rhode Island was the place that they built the ships that went to Africa and brought people back. Some of the people that they brought back, they kept in Rhode Island as domestics, but the majority those Rhode Island people sent the majority of the blacks to Cuba, where they had the plantations. So you see how they made the money, right? The plantations and setting all those boats and stuff back and forth. And some of those people were Quakers that were involved in that Rhode Island stuff. Those are some of the houses that we know were underground railroad uh, sites. And then there's uh, Timbuktu there. And over there's Jacob's Chapel. That was one of the first settlements, too, in, in New Jersey. OK, the book on this shelf is the first edition of Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. And we have other books, romantic books by Harriet Beecher Stowe that has to be put in there. So that's amazing. And over there, where those abolitionists are uh, listed. There is a man that Harriet Beecher Stowe patterned Uncle Tom after. He's the one that developed a settlement in Ontario, Canada called Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was called something else, but they um, commercialized it. 
There was a place in Ontario we could go when we were running away from the United States. And that was the man right there. And he, um, terrible time getting to Canada, right? He was slaved in Maryland. And his enslaver, he trusted 100%, but the enslaver did a terrible job in, in you know, keeping the faith. But he, um, yeah, Terry, uh, she patterned Uncle Tom after him. And he was always saying, I don't know, Mrs. Stowe. I'm not Uncle Tom, I'm not dead, you know? I'm not dead yet. But she did give him credit in one of her books. You know, that, that's what she did. Yeah, this is William Stills' uh, first edition of uh, Underground Railroad. And then this is like blackface after um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, Uncle Tom's Cabin, the thing with blackface, you know, their whites wore black faces. There were all kinds of places where they put on shows and stuff. That blackface thing was really uh, making a lot of money, you know, all over. There were uh, shows, people with black faces. And so you see black face dolls and we have some upstairs, a lot of stuff belongs in here, you know. Uh, doing that, it all emanated from her book. <laughs>